All Things Techie Podcast, brought to you by two tech junkies, Justin Dawson and Simon Lang. For more, visit www.allthingstech.ie for all things techie. It's 2019, our first episode of 2019 of All Things Tech uh, all things techie, rather. Uh, Simon Lang joins us in his new virtual uh, studio, uh, which is not McDonald's anymore, um, which is his home office, very, very nice, very tidy, with his Bluetooth headset as well, plugged into his uh, laptop. Uh, not, not bad quality there, Simon, with your Bluetooth headset. Yeah, not bad. These are Audio Technica headsets that I got. They released last year. They're... Um, not their low, low budget range, but you know, it's their not top end Bose compatible com- compared model that you're spending three, four hundred quid on. But Do still, you know what? Like, great. like I, I have to like eat some humble pie on this, Simon. I always thought like, what's going to happen when Apple take away the mini jack on their phones, and then it's like actually we don't need headphones anymore with a wire. It's Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Bluetooth. And you know what? I got Bluetooth headphones uh, for Christmas. Skull ca- no, is it Skull? Yes, it is Skull Candy headphones. They were about 100 euro. Absolutely amazing. Um, uh, over-ear headphones. Um, it's my way. I don't like the in-ear headphones personally. That's just a personal choice. Um, but uh, 100 euro and like listening to podcasts on the train like everyone has Bluetooth headphones anymore now. And, I, and I've seen what the whole, the AirPods, I think they're called the Apple's yeah. AirPod ones, everywhere. You turn yeah. around the office, everyone has them in the office. I was out jogging this morning or walking and loads of people were wearing them as well out doing exercising. It's just the norm now to see mm. these AirPods. I think Apple are really pushing the game here on us a little bit and you, yes, I agree. Getting rid of the connector was a big push, and I think it's the way forward. I think a lot of this show, Simon, I'm going to be starting to talk about like security ends of things that, like, actually, I don't, I personally admit, listeners, I don't, and viewers, I don't have the answers for, such as Bluetooth. When you get on a commuter train like that and you have hundreds and hundreds of passengers, how is it not interfering with one another? And also, I'm never asked for a pin for my Bluetooth headphones. How how is Joe Bloggs that's sitting next to me not listening to the same podcast to my device that I'm playing out the audio? I don't get it. It's technology that yeah, like it seems very insecure. I got to say from my point of view, we um disabled Bluetooth on some of our meeting room devices because mm. it didn't meet our security internal security standard mm. um, because I know there's new versions after just coming out I think of Bluetooth standards and um, I actually don't remember the numbers but it's still I think from a enterprise security point of view Bluetooth is still not what they would class as um, strong enough and safe enough. Now if any of our listeners can give us a, a document with all the techie information we can come back to another episode of that and talk about what, how is Bluetooth secure? Unless, I, I, can't, I can't remember, it was Christmas Day, I might have had a couple of drinks on me. So maybe I did type in a pin code at the very beginning that has just remembered on my device to connect my Bluetooth headphones. But mine didn't, for my days to this computer, they didn't ask me. I know it wasn't on the train, so it wasn't fighting with other people, but still, it didn't ask me, it just yes. asked me to choose the model and connect. But yet, never have I, uh, um, never have I interfered or got someone else's audio. That's that's the amazing thing. Like maybe you don't, maybe you don't need the encryption, or you well, you do need the encryption security with the. But does anyone want to care, care what I'm listening to on my headset, podcast, or whatever? But, but I suppose better said, would you be standing on the train connecting to your Bluetooth headset for the very first time anyway? Yeah. No. Most people probably do it in the privacy of their own home, so they know each other and they're already paired. Yes, yeah. But so you're just turning them on and they're reconnecting. But yeah, there is that chance you buy a new headset and say the person behind you happens at the same time do the same thing. Could you both pair to each other's phone or both to the same phone? 
I guess that's a possibility. Or maybe it's once it is paired, it's one connection and one connection only. Maybe that's the... Mm. We're looking for answers here, listeners. We sort of like delved into that head first in our first show <laughs> 2019. How does this work? Yeah, so um, let's give out our contact details. Uh, we're on the web on www.allthingstech.ie so for All Things Techie. Um, you can hashtag us at All Things Techie. And we, if you want to tweet me, it's at Justin or Dawson. And Simon is at Simon Lang AB because he can never remember his Twitter handle. <laughs> um, but you know, you know what? I, I must, before we go on, I must do a massive shout out to all the people that have put me forward in the semi finals of the AV Nations Readers Choice Awards for AV Professional of the Year. I didn't even know that AV Nation were doing these online voting system but like it i don't i know you've been following this simon but uh mark coxon who i would thought have absolutely just swept the board who you know i think is another absolute av guru over in america uh with his, his dual certs i thought he would sweep the board but he actually threw in the white tail and admitted to defeat to joe way in the semi-finals and um I think Joe Way is something like 800 votes up on him. So I think he's just gone around the whole of his university and said, uh, before I give you any AV support, you have to tick this box and vote for me. <laughs> uh, or he, he's just using sweets. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or sweet. yeah, yeah. Yeah, candy always goes well, you know. Listen up, Irish politicians. If you go, go, go along and... Uh, to a house with some chocolates, they will. People will vote for you. Could be myself and Joe Way in the finals, and we have agreed that we have to do a podcast. And it's sort of been like, and might get like Chris Netto to do uh, an AV Smackdown, where we have uh, myself and Joe Way head to head of going why we should win. It it, it sounds like a, a bad episode of Father Ted of who should get the parachute while jumping out of the plane. Or a presidential debate. (laughs) Or a presidential debate, yeah. I I need to find out some juicy information about Joe. And because he's such a good Christian and works for a church and everything, I don't think I'll find any bad information. I think he'll find more bad information about me. Did you know Justin used to work in pirate radio or something like that? Yeah, so you mean I'm going to start getting phone calls from Joe now? Yeah, <laughs> Joe, Simon, what do you know about Justin? Well, what do you want to know about Justin? There was this one time. Yes. Um, do, if you have any comments, listeners or viewers, please do get in touch with us on the Twitter handles and we're at allteenstech.ie. Stay with this podcast because it might be semi-long podcast we're going to try and condense it in this 60 minutes and um, which is what i consider the train commute to work that uh, you can listen to our podcast but um before we go into ces um i'm sure it made worldwide coverage that london heathrow and london gatwick airports were closed down while drones were spotted close to air um to planes rather um in the in the sky and it, it the whole airport just after christmas went into complete and utter shutdown with no planes flying uh so I mean, do you think this type of stuff could happen in ireland oh easily yeah i think our, our irish airports are probably even less secure from that point of view compared to the uk and um, because Ireland is seen as not our biggest target for terrorism and all like that. Mm. Um, but uh, I know that you, in the UK they've introduced lots of technology of like jammers and radio jammers and all like that around the airports just to try and get the drone down mm. and then to find out who it was. So, uh, but saying that Ireland has probably a lot more technology in that field than we realize. Um, I heard a long time back that like the Irish Army are one of the leaders in um, communications mm. um, in Europe when it comes to, uh, to that kind of technology. So you never know, Ireland might have better technology in place, we just don't realise it. Jack, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a very hot topic at the moment and I say you're out the door with, with, with requests for training. 
Yeah, it's definitely been busy um, over the last um, couple of months, uh, especially after all the incidents there in UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally over the time, we always had a lot of students and it's been, uh, it's been kind of busy always. <laughs> so that, that's always good for us. Yeah. Now, talking about the incident, how, do, how did it happen? Like, we, we did say that, like, can they not make drones so that if they enter airport areas, that it immediately sends an alert back to the pilot or the drone owner and said, hold on, you are flying into air-restricted spaces when not allowed to go there? Well, the technology already there from a uh, majority of the, the flight control software, say for the DJI or um, any of these kind of um, brands, Unique, there's geofencing already in place. So what happens is as soon as you try to take off in a, a restricted zone or an area you know, where it is um, very um, limitation set, then you can take off. And if you were to come to an area, it will actually stop flying into. Okay. So, so it's already there. The, you know, it's um, if you're a professional operator and you have your license and all that stuff like this, then you can, um, you know, fly in these areas. You can um, circumvent the software to go past it. Ah, so that that's maybe what happened over in Gatwick and what happened over in Heathrow. That someone went past the geo fence and is it it without saying hack the system? Is it easy to turn off the geo fencing on these DJI devices? Well, drones are not just um, straightforward um, one brand kind of, you know, majority of people fly with one or two brands. Oh, mm -hmm. There's one big brand from, it's called DJI. Okay. You know, it's, it's the easiest ones to pick up. You can pick it up at so many stores. You know, there's many um, um, hobby stores, and even big retailers starting to sell all these kind of drones. And they're the easiest ones. You can fly them literally by a press of a button. Now, these ones generally have all the um, restrictions in place and all the stuff like this, but there's so many other brands that you can buy that does not have these restrictions set in. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's potentially for somebody coming and want to um, cause a hazard, um, you know, they're out to cause harm. They, it, nothing's going to stop them, you know. Oh, this is or, true. Yeah, so I mean, like we have a very good, you know, um, base of professional operators here and even the recreational users, they're doing... You know, they know the rules and they know not to fly near airports and all the stuff like this. So these are not really the people to worry about. Mm -hmm. You know, like even, even normally people that, that would buy the drones would buy the kind of ones from more reputable brands or, you know, most of the cases. And there will be geofence, but um, I think common sense, you know, is, is pretty good here so far. So there's no incidents like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think that a normal 30 euro, 30 euro drone can cause as much damage as the likes of a DJI if it's flown in the incorrect airspace? Well, it really depends. You know, there's, um, there were studies being done on what, what the kind of effects are done, you know, to, to airplanes with the drones. And it's all about really about the, the mass, you know, and the kind of dual effect of, you know, everything um, colliding with the stuff. So I think a little 30 euro drone, um, birds are more dangerous, I would say, on the runway. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, they can do much more damage like that. And especially like small little drones, they, they don't really have the capacity to reach that far. Um, you know, so even if, you, if, you, if you're going to buy the bigger drones or anything like this, it's, you know, it, it's going to get hard to, that, to fly there. But again, if somebody wants to cause harm, they're going nothing, to harm. Um, this, you know, this, you cannot really stop um, anything about this. You know, this is um, kind of where the, where the um, kind of more active defense systems will come in place. But generally, like, um, you know, people are aware, there are many, the, we have um, strict rules in Ireland, and many people are aware of it, but we are, at flat out, what we're trying to do is just educate people more, you know, just the common sense of rules, and the um, Irish Aviation Authority as well, they, they post their leaflets and all the stuff like that, just to kind of give the general population, you know, guidance of where you can fly, where you cannot fly, and don't cause hazard or harm to, you know, everybody around you. Thanks so much for joining us on this, Mark. I've, I've just been reading a bit on Safe Drone about yourself. You're also a pilot for an Airbus A330 with Aer Lingus. That's right. Yeah, yeah I fly. Uh, so my main job, I guess, will be flying with Aer Lingus. Uh, I'm a pilot uh, with them and I fly the transatlantic routes with Aer Lingus on the Airbus 330. So I'm flying, I'm in the aviation industry about 22 years in total. So um, I have 15 years nearly in the Irish Air Corps as a military pilot right. and uh, left that after um, 15 and went straight to Aer Lingus then flying currently with Aer Lingus. So I have a huge background in the aviation um, in the aviation side of things and then a background obviously in the drone as well. You know? And 
so would the drone end of things just be a hobby to you or would it be a semi-professional thing as well? It's, no, it's semi-professional now, yeah. I mean, it started off um, uh, being, being, I suppose, being a pilot and being into aviation, you're into all sorts of aviation things. And growing up, I guess I would have, you know, read uh, aviation magazines and was interested in model aircraft and flew um, 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 model aircraft, flew them as well as built them, sorry. And uh, just naturally then as drones came out, I was always interested in technology, always interested in, in flying and now drones were up and running and I got into drones. I was able to combine the kind of aviation experience then with my uh, kind of passion for flying these little model aircraft and drones and uh, create what ultimately became Safe Drone. I started off originally just doing kind of um, flying drones for businesses that needed the, this new uh, aspect that uh, drone uh, video and photography could bring to their businesses. I had a bit of skill, I had a bit of knowledge and uh, got into just doing aerial video and aerial photography and um, got into modeling and 3D surveying. And as you, you could do more and more drones, um, I did more and more with the with the drones that I could do. But I always had that background in aviation, and I was an instructor pilot as well. So I had that uh, instructional uh, knowledge and background. And the Irish Aviation Authority knew about me, and they approached me to see if I could do some flight tests for them initially. Right. Uh, they have a flight test. Uh, um, uh, uh, they have a syllabus of training to get your permit and I became what's referred to as a, a flight test examiner with them and then got into a bit of uh, instructing with an old uh, school called ORPAS Training International, ORPAS being remotely piloted aircraft systems and then branched out on my own to create kind of safe drone and uh, uh, out of, I, I brought in a partner then, uh, Theodore Prince, ultimately to help me because it got it got very very busy you know i can imagine um, i can imagine so because it is getting now i've seen a lot from my audiovisual background i go over to integrated systems europe isc in amsterdam you see these massive drones that maybe are 20 30 000 euro that they, they can fly three or four kilometers away and it, it, it then uh, the likes of uh, some of the drone companies over in Amer uh, America and across Europe, they're saying, OK, you need to go off and get a license. Now, I see on your page, you're a, a member of the European Aviation Safety Agency who has created, as I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong, 2017, this act to say that it's across Europe now you have to have a drone licensed if you're going to have a drone up in the air. Yeah, well, the European Aviation Safety Agency is is basically in the Irish Aviation Authority regulate aviation matters in this country. Okay. And the European body uh, that does the equivalent, it would be EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency. So anywhere that EASA don't regulate, the national national authorities must regulate. Okay. Uh, currently, um, the EASA didn't have, uh, the European regulator didn't have regulations for drones below 150 kgs. So the Irish Aviation Authority had to fill that gap. Okay. But last year in September of last, of 2018, as it, it is now, uh, the the piece of regulation that created EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, was updated. That gave them a new mandate. That gave EASA a mandate then to regulate drones uh, below 150 kgs. Okay. And that, uh, as I said, that piece of regulation is now in place in September, and uh, they now have the mandate to regulate drones but they haven't br yet brought out their regulation, which we're expecting uh, possibly um, as early as April 2019, but certainly within the year of 2019. Now, it's not something that they've just started working on since last September, because they had the mandate they've known for a long time they are going to get this mandate as far back as 2014. Wow. And they've been working on, they've been working on um, 
various uh, notices of proposed amendments that they put out to industry and uh, within Europe. So there's been and there's been a lot of uh, consultation with industry and with the players in the European market. Uh, so the regulation for drones is pretty much set. It's just a matter of getting it actually out and signed off as a, as a legal piece of um, uh, documentation, you know. With drones, there's always a hazard of stuff, you know. Uh, many people don't realize that the drone can fall out of the sky at any moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think your drone is, you know, it's, it's a good brand, it's going to work, but um, components can fail at any time. And that's the thing is that's why the main law or rule um, set out is there, especially when it comes to safety, is never fly over people. Mm -hmm. You know, a professional drone oper uh, operators know to stay the distance away and they plan their shots ahead not to fly over people um, or our houses or anything like this. Um, and the general laws by the um, Irish Aviation is, is pretty relaxed in Ireland, I must say. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, like the, the main thing is that, you know, you cannot fly further. If you don't have a license, you cannot fly further than 300 meters away from you. Okay. You know, that, that's a kind of distance. You must always keep your line of sight of your drone to start with. And that way you can just check when there's manned aviation, you know, in the kind of in the air coming. There is a buffer zone, you know, between where the um, uh, unmanned aircraft fly and the manned aviation. You know, so there's a buffer zone already there. But that the main thing is, well, like, you know, you cannot fly higher than 120 meters as well. Yes. Um, yeah. that's, that's 400 feet now because manned aviation is 500 feet. That's where, you know, so um, okay. it gives a little um, leeway there. And the main thing is, well, like, if you don't have a license, you cannot fly closer than um, 30 meters from people, cars, buildings, um, you know, not under your control. And then when there's a group of 12 or more, it's 120 meters. Okay. You know, so the, the rules are there to keep distance already. Once you have your license, you can get tested and um, you have your um, specific operating permissions, which basically allow you to go closer to all that, or, you know, fly further, fly higher, all this kind of stuff. Let's focus for a moment on what happened over the winter time, over the Christmas time and into the new year, with what happened over in Heathrow and Gatwick. Yeah. How did it happen? I, I know I say, how did it happen? It's, I would have believed that drones were on a certain frequency that straight away, if they flew into an airport territory, they can be knocked out straight away. Uh, no, well, they, they work on, they work, so a drone works, there's a link between the controller and uh, the physical air piece of the drone that is flying. So it's been operated from the ground and it's flying in the air and it's operating on uh, an open piece of frequency, 2.4 gigahertz or maybe 5.8 gigahertz. They're free to use, okay, so you don't need a permit to use those and that's why uh, drones use that frequency for control and for data and video and stuff like that. So those frequencies are monitored um, or can be monitored, but they're not routinely monitored by uh, airports or anything like that. And just because something is transmitting on that frequency doesn't mean it's a drone. Because it's a free-to-use frequency, anything could be transmitting on it. So your microwave oven, for example, works at 2.4 gigahertz. The zapper that you use to open your garage even, or, or even old radio microphones, handheld radio microphones. Yeah, radio yeah. So, yeah. So, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, technology out there actually broadcasting on that frequency. So if you were just monitoring that frequency, um, you could be monitoring anything. So it's no good indicator that there's a drone out there. Um, currently, the problem with the likes of Gatwick and Heathrow and the airports all over the world is they're operating in a vacuum of information. They don't know, other than the aircraft that are flying out there, they don't know what else is, is flying out there because the, the, the systems they use to monitor aircraft are large radar dishes that are pointed up into the sky, so they're looking up and not down. They're also, the resolution of that radar is, is, is for larger objects. It's not designed to detect smaller objects. So. I know there's large drones out there, but they're not large enough to be detected by radar uh, or aviation standard radar that you'd find at airports today. Uh, also, the fact that drones are made out of plastics and carbon fibers, you know, they're not the easiest. They, do, they don't really reflect radar uh, imagery. So what I'm saying is all these airports, airports around the world, they're operating in a vacuum of, of um, information. And if someone rings up, 
an airport authority and say, hey, I can see a drone flying close to the runway or on the extended runway center line. Uh, the airport has to take that at face value. And aviation is a very safety conscious industry. Uh, the safety record of aviation is second to no other industry in the world. And we take safe decisions all the time within that industry. So the airport operator has to take the decision then, right? We can't put any of our commercial air traffic at risk. So we're just gonna either stop uh, uh, movements in and out of the airport or close the airport completely, as Gatwick had to do. So they're just operating, they, they don't have any systems out there um, at their disposal yet. Uh, uh, sorry, the Gatwick Airport didn't have any systems in place uh, on those days um as part of its infrastructure to detect drones so they had to bring that in and we heard systems coming in from the military and and other sources to try and help detect that drone that was uh, allegedly out there um now the ins and outs i don't know i have as much information as you have or your listeners have as to whether there was or there wasn't information and i guess the, the, the report into that incident would be a very interesting one for everybody, okay, because, um, uh, you know, what somebody sees on the ground isn't necessarily what's in the air, you know, if they're looking into the air, it may have been a drone, it may have been lights from some other aircraft, it may have been a helicopter, who knows what it was. <laughs> it could have been anything, it yeah. could really, honestly, it could have been anything, and that's my point, that until the airports can have uh, you know technology infrastructure in place to you know detect the likes of drones um they're going to live in that vacuum and they'll make a safe decision based on the information they're given even if that is only word of mouth if they put in a blocker in an airport um would that interfere with the tower talking to the pilots on a plane or are you on a different frequency a total higher frequency yeah, no, where where uh, pilot communications would be on uh, megahertz and uh, a much lower frequency than um, the gigahertz frequency that uh, drones are operating on, for the most part. So, so there'd be no, uh, you know, putting a blocker out to block the 2.4 gigahertz or the 5.8 gigahertz frequency the drones are using uh, would wouldn't be an issue for aviation. Uh, manned aviation in the area but it's a very uh, indiscriminate sort of thing to do and you don't know what else you're blocking out i mean wi-fi or wi-fi in the airports works at 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 as well so you'll be blocking out wi-fi signals all over the place as well okay so, and, uh, and one of the issues that it's not just about detecting uh, um uh, the drone once you detect it you have to you have to decide what it is you want to do if that uh, if that drone has been belligerent or it's or it's or it's just causing a safety uh, issue uh, taking over drone is is not an easy thing to do because there's the whole legal ramifications of if the airport authority can firstly detect a drone and then try and interfere with that drone by making it land or move somewhere else there's the whole legal ramification of who's in charge of that drone at that point in time then. If that drone was to fall out of the sky and cause an incident on the ground, who is legally responsible then? So it's not just a matter of, of blocking a signal or forcing a drone to do something. We have to think beyond that in terms of, you know, all the layers of potential outcomes. And, and that's why that's why this is a sticky area of the, the counter drone area. Uh, the, the counter drone industry has to deal with this and the regulators need to deal with this and, and, and we're not really having that discussion yet or the industry isn't having that discussion yet. The, 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 the damage that a drone will do to the aircraft, it's all real hearsay. There's only, beginning to, uh, there's only the beginnings of um, uh, testing to see what happens if a drone impacts an aircraft. Where it impacts the aircraft will have a big uh, impact on the outcome of that impact. So a drone going into the engine of an aircraft, we don't really know because there's no testing to know what happens when a, when a, a 30 euro drone, which I would imagine would be fairly frangible and very, very small, uh, very small parts and probably won't do much. But a larger drone, you know, the, the, the size of drones and the cost of them, you know, for less than 5,000 euro, you can buy a fairly substantial drone 
that weighs, you know, four kg, is made of fairly dense um, uh, um, uh, lithium polymer batteries or fairly dense plastics, uh, a hard, uh, non-frangible material. And that stuff, you know, flying into an engine, exploding the lithium battery, exploding within the engine, we don't know what is going to happen in an engine. Uh, of an aircraft. Likewise, if it flies into the wing, there's a lot of systems contained within the wings. Uh, you've got your fuel in the wing, you've got your hydraulics in your wing, you've got a lot of electrical systems. The impact, you know, losing those systems for uh, a pilot, you know, they're trained, we're trained to deal with losing systems, but takeoff and landing is a fairly critical stage and we're always talking about being stabilized. It's drilled into us all the time that we need to be Aircraft need to be stabilized, so the, air, uh, the pilots are always striving to make sure that those critical moments when you're coming into land and when you're taking off, you're as stabilized as possible. Throwing a drone into the mix is, is creating, although pilots are trained for it, it's making it difficult to, uh, for them. Um, uh, and without testing, more so than how the pilots would operate, you know, without testing to know what impact uh, a drone impact on an aircraft will have, is it's hard to really say with any degree of certainty what the outcomes will be. And then, you know, we can't train our pilots to deal with those outcomes once they're known. Now that's for larger aircraft. Uh, I would say uh, smaller aircraft, such as your small Cessnas and particularly helicopters, um, a drone impacting those types of machines, the outcome could be quite disastrous because they're not the, built to the same design standards and particularly helicopters with the rotor, rotating above the cabin and that small little rotor at the back they're very finely balanced and um, as we saw you know losing uh, when we think the uh, the Leicester City owner that helicopter crashed it's something to do with losing control of the back of his of that helicopter so a drone impacting that could have fairly serious ramifications for a helicopter so it's the smaller aircraft uh, that are worrisome but the larger aircraft we still don't have any information on those as well as to what will happen so it's a big it's a big research area for uh, regulators to kind of sort of start pushing to get this research and, uh, done so we can start coming up with some answer and some answers and then train our pilot body if that's required hmm. now I always think back to gun licenses over in the States. Can they make it that if you want to buy a drone, whether it be a 30 euro drone, whether it be a 2,000 euro drone, you have to pass a test beforehand? Uh, in the US? Well, no, wait, I, I'm, I'm just comparing it to US and gun control. Like, okay, have a license before you can actually have one of these devices. Do you think that's ever going to happen with, with the likes of drones? Uh, no, because I, I do think there are drones out there that are, are toys uh, and, you know, we shouldn't, they, they, their capabilities aren't that, um, they're not that capable, you know, they can't fly very far, they can't fly very hard or very high. Uh, but anyone that really wants to use a drone in any sort of professional way or use a drone commercially, or uh, even use a larger drone for uh, pure fun or in a hobbyist way, I think education is certainly key. And you're going to say that I, I have Safe Drone Academy and we're a training in, uh, institution and that, but um, knowledge is key to a lot of things and your attitude is key. And, you know, being educated in a particular way improves your knowledge and improves your attitude to what it is you're doing. And I think even the most basic rudimentary uh, training for even a hobbyist pilot flying a larger uh, drone is certainly a requirement. And some of the better manufacturers out there, when you log on to their systems, a lot of these drones now are flown through an app on a phone or through an app on a controller. They can provide some level of education and I think that should be mandated uh, so that when, it, when someone turns on their drone for the very first time, they're forced to kind of read and uh, cycle through either a video or some sort of uh, education um, uh, through the app that advises them about the do's and the don'ts. And the Irish Aviation Authority have recently re-released their uh, do's and don'ts pamphlet. And for anybody who wants to get the very basics of knowledge, they could go onto the IAA.ie website and you can find that pamphlet. You'll find it in the drone section. I do believe though, to get back to your question, uh, yes, training and education is key. 
the more you want to do with your drone, I think it, the more you should have to come to um, uh, you know, a training institute anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world to get educated on what it is you do. Particularly, and I feel strongly about this, anyone who wants to operate commercially should have to go through Absolutely. some level of, of training and awareness. And, um, uh, you know, if you, if you hire a professional, you expect a level of, of knowledge and a level of capability on their part. And without having some form of education program for those drone pilots, um, professional drone pilots, you know, you're not going to guarantee that you're going to have that level of professionalism, you know? If, if you are a hobbyist and you just want to get into the drone area, is it worthwhile taking a course? Yeah, we have an online course, you know, especially aimed for recreational users that if, you, if you're not sure if you want to, you know, pay, you know, all the, the money to get your certification on, um, everything like this. And it gives you a good overview of, you know, what's the laws in Ireland, you know, what kind of admin is involved, you know, just what do you do on a basic drone operation? Because most of the time you just don't show up to a place and fly. It does, that doesn't work like that. And, you know, you, you can show as well, like if you want to move into the commercial area, you know, so we have, we have a whole um, kind of video lecture for that already. But what we find is a lot of people, like all, all our clients are not, um, you know, just private based. We deal with a lot of um, county councils, search and rescue teams, um, defense forces, all these kind of little groups. And um, the drones are more now that it's a tool for the business rather than people, you know, pilots looking to get licensed. So you kind of see the scope changing there mm -hmm. where a lot of corporations or like um, organizations take on drones just as a tool. So to train up their staff to use the drones and um, operate safely and just add it to their process, you know, going on there. So what, what does the course entail? So you have your online course if, you're, if you want to do that, if you want to go more. How long is the online course? Well, it would take a couple of hours to go through. Um, the, the nice thing is that you don't need to set the whole thing in one go. Um, it remembers where you kind of take off. There's different parts of the, you know, kind of videos to go through in different sections. So you can do it as you really please and you know what you feel like. And then our main, our main selling that, you know, we find a lot of the time is um, we do a, the, um, our full IAA package. Now you get a, to, to get your license in Ireland, you need to, there's a, it's a kind of steps that you have to go through. First, you need to have your ground school certification. And this is, um, this is the first step. Even people that want to go into the commercial stage, but doesn't want to go the full length, for instance, um, get your insurance, get, you know, the, the flight testing done. We recommend everybody to set the ground school first. That's a two day course that we, most of the time it's in Dunleary that we hold the, the courses there. Course runs nine to five and we do midweek courses. We do weekend courses as well. We do them every um, fortnight as it goes throughout the year. And the ground school is a good start because it shows you all the administration involved, all the safety aspects of drone operations. Um, shows you everything about the airspace, about the reading the weather. So anything really that goes about drone operations. Um, is in that two-day ground school course. At the end, you've got your ground school certification as well, which is a bonus. So if you were to decide to go on to the next step and do your flight testing, um, set up your operations manual and get ready, you know, become a licensed pilot, then you can just do the next step and get that done. The regulation says that there's certain things you can and you can't do. So one of the, one of the things you can't do with a drone is fly in this sort of, I refer to as no drone airspace, but it's referred to really, its real name is controlled airspace. Okay, so you're not, the regulation says you're not allowed to fly in there unless you have a permit. Okay. okay, the regulation also restricts you from doing things like flying higher than 120 meters above ground level or flying the drone further than 300 meters away from yourself. You must always keep the drone in your visual line of sight. So it can't go behind a building out of your line of sight. You can't, can't fly from inside your car. You always have to be flying it uh, and maintaining visual line of sight as the person who's flying it. And there's other, other restrictions about how close you get to people with your drone, which is 30 meters for uh, someone who's not in your control. You can't get any closer than 30 meters to them. And then that increases to 120 meters as a group. So the regulation has things in it that you can't do, okay? Unless you have a permit. So if you want to fly in this controlled airspace or this no drone airspace, you need a permit. If you want to fly your drone further than 300 meters away from yourself or higher than 120 meters above ground, you need a permit. Right. These are what the Aviation Authority referred to as their 
a, a risk-based regulation. As the risk increases, you have to, there's, there's regulation, there's permits required to do it. The insurance industry as well has kind of copped on to the permitting system. And if you're a commercial um, uh, pilot, you probably need to have public liability insurance in place uh, to do your commercial operations. And the insurance companies, yeah, the insurance companies won't give you proper public liability insurance without having a permit. Okay, so there's a need for permits. The Aviation Authority don't actually run any training courses that you need to sit on to get this permit. So that's where the likes of Safe Drone steps in. We run the training syllabus and the testing syllabus that people need to take to attain their permits. So currently we run a two day ground school okay. and we run it every month. And sometimes we run it twice a month. We do weekend courses, we do midweek courses. Uh, it's two days with us, two full days, 14 hours nearly each day. Um, or sorry, 14 hours of lecture over, uh, over uh, the two days. And um, uh, once you've got two days of training done, you go away, you do a little bit of preparation for your flight test, pass the flight test, and we'll stamp and sign all your paperwork. You then make a personal application to the Aviation Authority who will then issue your permit. And then your permit allows you to do the things that the regulation doesn't allow you to. Okay. okay. Now, I'm um, going to ask you one question there. You say you have to do a flight test. Is that with a drone in the air? Oh, yeah, that is with a drone. So it's, it's referred to, it's actually referred to as a competency check. So you have to, you, have to, you know, uh, prove your competency in terms of doing the basic maneuvers with a drone. So that's not just physically flying. That's all about your preparation first flight your site review, where you're flying, have you determined the risks of the various threats that are out there to your, in your flying area? And how is your preparation being in terms of getting the drone ready for flight so it's safe to flight? So simple things like, have you charged the batteries? Have you put the propellers on properly? Have you checked to see that everything on the drone is correct? Uh, to basically flying the drone, doing a control check and doing some basic flight maneuvers to show that you have a competency in terms of your ability to handle the drone uh, under various uh, uh, scenarios. And then uh, we have a few little uh, abnormal and emergency procedures that you have to demonstrate a competency and being able to uh, 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 handle. So that will be what we refer to as the flight test. And that needs to be passed as well. Uh, before the authority will give you your permit, you have to be able to demonstrate some level of competency. There are some things that you would need to go to the Aviation Authority. Uh, it's basically, oh, look, I have this idea. I want to do this with a drone. It's outside the regulations completely. I'm not sure where it stands. It's a little bit risky. Uh, can we do it? They might say to you, um, uh, okay, do your risk assessment, come back, show us all your mitigations, and we'll make a call on whether or not uh, you can do it. But that's not really what they want you to do. As a permitted operator, you're considered to have taken a level of training. Uh, within that training, there's uh, risk assessments uh, uh, and uh, understanding risks. So you, have, you, you basically get approved for a process. Your risk assessment process is approved. And then as a professional operator, you go out and it's, it's expected that you will adopt a professional approach to the site that you're flying in and take the necessary mitigatory actions that reduce the risk that your drone uh, um, is exposed to and your drone operation is exposed to. You're kind of a, you're approved for that process, so you don't have to apply every single time to the aviation authority with a risk risk assessment saying, "Hey, I want to do this. Can I can I get approval to do it?" They're not. They don't. They don't want to to do that. They don't have that level of oversight. Uh, they're approving you. They're asking you to do it, and you need to be able to prove that you have done it when they come and audit your your business or your drone operation. And they see that you are flying it somewhere and they might want to see your risk assessment. Okay, uh, so, uh, but that's for the sort of the, the kind of the general sort of risky stuff. If there's something that is really, you know, 
very, very different from what normal drone pilots are doing. Well, then they might be interested in, 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 in understanding a little bit more, um, understanding better uh, what it is you're doing, and they'll, they'll ask then for a, a risk assessment. So, but I'm trying, I'm trying to get, so, so something like beyond visual, I said to you earlier on, like visual line of sight, you must maintain visual line of sight with your drone, okay? Now, if you want to operate beyond visual line of sight, there's no permit. The permit doesn't give you beyond visual line of sight per permission, okay? So you can't ordinarily do that. And that's an area, that's an example of an area that say that it was something you wanted to do, that you would then approach the aviation authority and go, look, I want to do this beyond visual line of sight operation. I won't be able to see the drone. I've done my risk assessment. I've done, these are all my mitigating actions. Do you think this is okay? And they may or may not stamp and approve that particular flight. But ordinarily, the mundane sort of normal risk assessment about uh, you know, your average flying area, they don't want to get involved with that. It's more the type of operation that might be slightly outside the norm. That's the type of risk assessment uh, that they would want, they would be more interested in. Where does the law come on that basis that you are flying in the air and you might be in line of sight, but people on the ground are saying, hold on a minute, I don't want to be in this. Yeah, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, the drone is just a tool to move a camera around the place, for example, okay? So, I mean, our course is designed to, for the, dro uh, the drone side of things, but we are required to give some information on the likes of privacy, and we have a little section on our course that deals with privacy, and we have a little section on our course that deals with data protection, and all the standard data protection and uh, uh, rules uh, that would apply to a cameraman on the ground with a ground camera, uh, apply equally to a drone, okay? So uh, drone operators, professional drone operators need to go out there and they need to understand that uh, that law, you know, the, 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 um, the data protection law is about, you know, firstly, the data that they're capturing, you know, at the very basic level, you know, you don't want to be capturing people's uh, individual faces or anything personal, you know, um, locations or people's faces or carriage plates, all that sort of usual stuff equally applies to drones and the drone pilot has to do his own data impact assessment to determine, you know, is he going to capture, uh, are they going to capture this information and if they definitely are, well then they'll take the normal procedures to either get permission to use people's uh, data or they'll change their operation so that they don't capture it in the first place. At the very basics, Always just fly safe. Don't fly close to airports. Don't fly higher than 120 meters above ground level. Always keep your drone in your visual line of sight. And don't fly the drone, you know, closer than 30 meters to people. Uh, you know, it's just the, the technology in drones is kind of, it's, it's immature in many ways. It's not certified in any particular way and component failure happens. So we don't want drones falling out of the sky in the wrong places. Drones are coming out all the time, Simon. Yes. How have they not made it so it's a trackable device that if you buy one of these devices, that if they if someone spots it coming into a certain area, it knows who is the owner of the device. So it's nearly like having a gun license. Yeah. Like the process you have to go through, I think in the States is quite rigorous, where like in Ireland, I think it's probably the same because we just don't have very many guns as the US would have. But you have to go fill out the forms and a whole load of rigmarole. And being um, we have a communications regulator. Yeah, Comrade. You would expect Comrade, who you'd expect, they would um, want to know who's flying these things and what frequencies they're using and all that stuff. So I'm surprised it's not a, a more regulated thing. Well, when London Gatwick and London Heathrow happened, I thought to myself, well, surely. Is is the is it if they put in a jammer, will it interfere with airport controls and talk back from pilots to to the tower? Clearly not. But you you would think that something can be made on all airports now, and it should be a a requirement that you fly a drone over an air 
space, the drone will fall out of the sky. But you know, I, I, I'm going to add some vi uh, pictures to the All Teens Techie um, video feed here. And one of them that I really loved was Theresa May, a, a little photo of Theresa May uh, holding a drone uh, controls, remote controls, and she goes, this will shut them up about Brexit for a while. <laughs> yeah, and that's all they're talking about here at the moment is break the Brexit. And I know it's not really a techie topic, but it's still affecting the industry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But you know what, Simon? Um, it With Brexit and everything going on and projects, unfortunately, Simon won't be joining me with it in ISE, which is it just, it's upsetting. But you know what? Um, watching videos as well, Simon, and um, getting your Rise magazine or whatever. What are you hoping to hear and and find out about about ISE? Like, is there any really things that really caught your attention from the reading magazines and reading, reading blog posts? Now, I think um, for me, it's probably because I'm in a corporate environment. I'm interested in what's coming out in the corporate meeting room space hmm. and um, and seeing how they're increasing the collaboration within meetings um, or remote meetings to meetings, introducing more stuff that's G Suite compatible, because um, it seems to be a bit of a, a gap in one way that it's either extreme on one side like Jamboards or something on the other side like Avacor, where mm -hmm. you know, you're looking for something that's a hybrid of the middle. Yes. That's, yes. Um, that kind of thing. And um, also, about this, there was a whole lot of stuff at CS about security. Mm. There was a big thing about user security and privacy and stuff like that. And I'm just seeing is there anything going to come into the into the professional tech market? Because corporate security is just becoming a massive area, and the equipment that we're putting in has to kind of come to the same standards mm. that corporate technology security is at. So. I'm interested to see where, where that field is kind of going to go and what what manufacturers are doing. Um, like the Crestron NVX stuff is quite um, quite secure. Is you're able to put certificates onto it, that kind of stuff. Like it's really thinking like an IT security person, but with an AV head on is really the one thing that I really liked, and I I've seen it at the LTSMG, and I know it's. It's been out there for a while, but it's it's constantly improving. It's, it's Sennheiser's range of microphones where the AV technician knows instantly that a microphone ha or a clip mic has not been returned to a base, so the battery's running low, and it sends an alert. They are working on UK SMS messages where you can get an SMS message going, microphone number two in room, a is running low and they know straight away that they ha can have to go to that room. I think that that's, that's the type of technology that every AV technician wants mm. if they're looking after several meeting rooms around the place. I just thought that the new Sennheiser range is fantastic for that. And also, it's like it automatically detects if it's interfering with another frequency. That's, I think, it's so highly important. How many times have we done live events, Simon, where we had problems with that? Especially, yeah, when we're next door to a large um, convention center, which could have hundreds of microphones going. Mm. Um, so, yes, that is an issue all the time. The technology is there, but I think it's also quite expensive for corporate to initiate or initiate, install such a kind of a large frequency monitoring tool that automatically switches frequencies when interference comes and it's a big investment for companies to make. Personally so for me personally for me at ISE, like I am only going over for the two days, so like one night um really. Uh the first day is gonna be all for education and the higher ed conference that um that Evixa is putting on. Uh, I'll be attending. I'm also doing a flash track. So if you're there on Tuesday, please do not heckle from the back of the room. Um, or if you're heckling, please do professional heckling, you know. Um, but uh, I'm doing one on the do's and don'ts of virtual meetings because I know we both, Simon, in our AV support and technician roles, we have experienced some 
very funny moments and I'm um, going to be interacting with the audience that attend the flash track and call it the virtual meeting bingo of how many different items can they take off the list of things that have happened to them in virtual meetings and sure even on the setup of this video call we we were having technical difficulties as well but you know at least we know how to fix them and uh, it's the do's and don'ts yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we won't say anything more about that oh, sounds hot um but the one do i will actually turn around some of the stalls i don't think i'll get around to everything on on wednesday um, but um we never get to everything when we were there for two days and we even split up Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, but do do if you do see me walking around, please come up and say hello and tell me that you love the podcast or something like that, and make me feel nice and warm on Wednesday. Um, but the one thing that I think has attracted me to see is this roll up TV to ISC as well, because we're talking about a, a TV that literally rolled up into a sound box. And uh, you, you've, you've seen this as well, Simon. Yeah, yeah, because I was, my head actually even jumped that you could even push it at, like, depends on which the feed is at the bottom, but you could actually nearly push it into the floor. Mm. Yeah. Or, it's, or it's like a projector that rolls down from the ceiling, but it's a TV. Yeah, or if you want home entertainment, this thing could be, positioned at the end of your bed if you really wanted to be lazy and never leave the bed yeah. you know and um, it do you know what everyone's been saying that 2019 is going to be the year of bendable um, smartphones and tablets and they did some some companies have creation ones well you know what if they're able to bend a tv into a box like that samsung I believe already have the technology to bring out these mobile phones that's going to bend. Yes, so you have a little seven inch tablet or whatever, and it then becomes your whatever half that is mobile phone size. And uh, it would be interesting because then you could, because they'd often find that even in a business situation where you have like an iPhone Plus or some of the bigger Android phones where you're working on a document on the fly, it's actually be handy to be able to flip it open and you have maybe a tablet size computer yeah to work on and like with your cloud computing now stuff you don't even need much processing power really because everything's in the cloud all you need is a connection well that's and very bigger good. surface will make it very it's very convenient i don't know will it catch on i i, I know it, it sounds like justin's new thing about uh headphones uh that or phones without headphone jacks it will never catch on but th i think that's my thing for 2019 i I just think that it looks a bit gimmicky, it, like the folds and the the actual where it folds. You can still see the image. You know, if you want, if you want a smaller device, buy a smaller device. If you want a big device, buy a big device. That's that's my thoughts. Yeah, and I because my thought went to when you see it bending, does it not turn off from the bend all the way to the back? Because mm. you wouldn't want it to be touching in your pocket. Yeah. And yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you could. Uh, how, or, or does it not bend the other way? Because on itself, because if it's bent, how do you protect it from falls if it's the screen all the way around? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is it. Like, and what type of glass are they are they using in these devices to make it bend? And when. I think the next AV slash IT support type of thing is like uh, people coming into to the help desks and going, oh, I thought this device was spendable. It's not really. And a smash screen. That, I, 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 you know, we've seen a couple of interesting things of like pens being left in laptops and the laptop lids being closed and smashy, smashy goes the screen throughout our time. Oh. And, and especially now when computer screens are like maybe four to three to four mil tick, including the casing. Mm. Uh, it's like it, they're just getting so thin. And but the other side, the flexible screen would actually work on your computer if you left the pen in because it would just bubble up. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that is like, yeah. Or, yeah. Or on the band, maybe have one of these magnetic detachable pens. Hey, stylus. Whoa, patent pending there, guys. Yeah. How's about a stylus that clips onto the side where it bends? Woo. I, th- I think that. Yeah, Samsung, you can buy that off me, you know, and, and fund, fund uh, the, the show. Some, going from small to big, I sort of made a bit of a list here, Simon, on, on things that like were pretty cool that attracted my attention. Of Now, we weren't, I must say to our listeners we were, and viewers, we weren't at CES, but we've been doing a lot of read-ups. And if anyone ever wants to fund us going over to CES to talk tech, uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, you can get in contact with our, on, a, on our site, all things tech.ie but uh the cube which is like pretty much a copy of the tile the new style tile i sent you a link there it's a little tracking device 30 bucks um 30 dollars it you know i i like these type of small little devices if 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 you can keep track of where things are going to be yeah i seen one in you the the tile ones in use um at uh, Christmas, um, oh. my mother-in-law and my mother-in-law got one or similar, where she has it a bit of with an app on her phone, and you can either so she attached the tile to her keys, so you can have either way. It works both ways. So if you have your keys and you can't find your phone, you press the tile, the phone starts buzzing. Or you have the reverse, that if you can't find your keys, you press it on your phone and the tile starts making it. So it's like it's quite a clever little gizmo for that kind of stuff stop you from losing it yeah and i i i actually did like that like it, it, simple devices and um, then there was some that like you were going from small to extremely extremely big flying hovercrafts and then bell reveals the world's first realistic air taxi concept at ces 2019 it looks like a batmobile that can fly there was a lot of stuff in cars, I think, at um, CS this year to do with like auto technology stuff and what can you have in car. And there was something, I did see a headline, I didn't read the article, and I think it was Bose were doing something about the noise cancellation stuff, like having headphones in cars. And I was thinking that's something I would definitely be interested in because I would say when I'm in a car, I can't hear the people in the back. And I often go, why do they not have like a conferencing, in-car conferencing system where you have speakers and microphones front and back so you can hear the people in the back and talk to you? So I'd be interested in that, in the whole noise cancellation of road noise. It, it, it does get scary of how far we can push this. And then you go, without, like you say, don't use your mobile phones while driving, but... You know, it, it could get to the stage where you could be doing virtual meetings in your car while you're on the road and driving. Okay, Google will probably turn around and say, well, we're going to have automated cars that drive for themselves in the next five or ten years. But with the one, of, one that did catch my attention, I'll have to find the link as well, was maybe it was Samsung testing this or LG I have to find the link again maybe it was a Chinese company I have to find the link and um, I'll try and add it into our show notes but it was the passenger window the back passenger window was made to be um, an augmented reality screen in the car so your kid could be sitting in the back Rebecca could be sitting in the back and she goes past a tree she can then get her finger and start drawing on the window and drawing like as if you were drawing on a touch board with a marker, the tree, and then be drawing her little pictures and everything. Very gimmicky, but I, uh, but does it distract the kids for that time? But then if they, you say, Simon, if they're able to do that, what's to say they can't make a see-through augmented reality type of screen for the driver to be having a video conference call while driving, like you say, with sound reduced headphones. Like a heads up display, like a heads up display nearly like what they have in um, planes. Yeah. Pressure planes, but still giving you all the road information and you're still watching the road. Yeah, like there, there is, there is 
devices they can get, like little mirrors that you can put on dashboards and it can tell you your speed and your petrol and whatever, and it connects up to your computer or the computer in your car or the electronics of your car. But if you had a full screen in front that you can go right and you can say, hey, Google, hey, Alexa, or whatever, call Simon and have a video chat with Simon on one side while you are actually driving the car. This is where things can get out of control and dangerous at the same time. But the barriers are being pushed in technology constantly. And that's why I love just having read-ups on CES. Um, different other ideas, pillow, uh, the medication or meditation rather device, like a load, load of things that sit in things, um, couches that, you, that, that they'll automatically recognize that what muscle, they do a scan of your body and go, okay, I'm going to massage the lower part of your back or your thighs or whatever. Um, Oh. So, but one one that <laughs> one that everyone's talking about, Simon, is and stuff that you, you wouldn't really think about at CES and technology is food, the impossible burger. Did you see this? The, 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 the... Yeah. All organic stuff. Yeah. It's not even it's not even a burger, but even in the sense you think a burger, like a McDonald's or Vegans of the that, world yeah. unite, you know, like this, this is where the yeah. vegan world will come in and go, it's not actually a burger, it's an impossible burger. But these, these guys were standing outside giving out free samples of, of burgers. And uh, I don't know, I, yeah, I don't know what, what that type of idea catch on. I, I, I try it, I, you know, if you, I suppose if you have someone who has any special food requirements, why not, if that works for them, so they can still enjoy, enjoy going out and, and have um, have a good time and try nice food, why not? But it comes down to money at the end of the day, doesn't it? It's how much it's going to cost compared to a regular burger. Yeah, how much is, yeah, how much is this going to cost? Um, a lot of Internet of Thing devices, especially for the home, the home uh, setup. And yeah. Because I'm looking down through here the CS website of products that are released, and the one topic that keeps popping out to me is um, locks, yes. doors, cameras, having remote locks that you can just walk up and touch your phone off the door and it unlocks it for you because it knows your phone is, is you. And it's like it's kind of like taking all that kind of technology to a whole new level that it's. Um, securing your home but your phone is still the central piece of it all well you know what like it it brings back the old argument that's been used on hashtag av in the am uh, on on sunday mornings in uh, across the states and also on a global level you know what's it and what's av you know <laughs> With, without getting into this whole co conversation because that's a podcast in itself you know, in my views, is it audio? Well, then it's AV. Is it visual? Well, then it's AV. You know, so these type of devices and Internet of Teams devices and Alexa and voice control, which was massive at IS, or not ISE, at CS this year, and um, will be massive at ISE as well, and I, uh, I'm sure. But both in a commercial environment, residential environment, people want voice control uh with their internet of teams devices if it doesn't have voice control you know like even you're talking about cameras and locks and whatever but nine times out of ten it's like oh we can we can control this with voice control you know hey alexa unlock the front door and i will lock the front door and um, or turn on my tv what's the cameras and um, but it comes back to without going into like what's it and what's av you know it is converging a lot but I think still on an AV level and this is where I go into the AV level of this reading all these pieces of information on CES and cameras and and internet of teams devices a lot of them need extra additional hubs and okay 
I know listeners and viewers are going to say, Justin, that's that's IT. But, you know, when it comes down to HMI cables and whatnot to, to hook it all up, it needs hubs. And I, I, I was just realizing that, like, if I wanted to get, let's say I'm going to use, example, Arlo, have um, camera, outdoor cameras that are magnetic, that you can... Uh, no wires needed. Have has a mount. You put the mount on your outside of your house, but it needs a hub. Well, already in my house, I have the hive hub, which is controlling my um, my gas and my lights, and I have um, another like I I have all I have my Vodafone router in my house, but ha has four external connections. I have the hive plugged in. I have my internet, the TV plugged in, and which means that like the more hubs you get, the less the 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 more hubs you need for controlling your cameras and whatever in your house, you're not going to have a switch big enough. Yeah, and that's becoming the thing. Like you're you're hearing not in Ireland as much. I think you see it a lot on Facebook and. And um, in the states where they uh, have like forty-eight and twenty-four port switches in their houses, just to connect everything together on a single connection to the router, like uh, it's becoming that way where people are like the houses can be completely networked with cables all over the place. Because if you have four kids who are teenagers, all four kids will probably want an Xbox or a Wii or something. They're all internet connections. Then you got your TVs, as you say, your Nest or whatever kind of all your security stuff, and um, your fridge, your washing machine, your cooker, your mm. your microwave, your kettle. It's like they all. I know it's all Wi-Fi love. It so it's down to now is your Wi-Fi router able to handle all this, and will and your mobile phone and your tablets are all going to start losing deteriorating in quality and speed because your router has been overloaded with the 40 devices in your house that's our biggest problem here in ireland especially like okay things that's come out from ces and a big electronic show it's america and then you have chinese and asian companies coming in and they're they're highlighting these new technologies and you know ireland will get it late as always like we're we're on the the backbone of it. but you know 8k tvs and the wall like that's another one that we have to just throw out there from ces the wall 219 inch you know like you start saying if that's if it's a 219 inch screen and the pixel ratio and the quality of that it takes a new level of like if you were actually making films you know you don't need to like spend years in editing suites. You know, you could put anything in the background of of a film by just having a person stand in front of a wall of uh, of displaying whatever. So that's a, sort of a sidetrack. But AK TVs, we talk about, is it needed? Is there anything broadcasting in AK at the moment? Will Sky. Oh, anything broadcasting in Ireland on 4K. This is it. Never mind 8. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so we're not even we're not even officially broadcasting TV stations and TV shows and soccer matches in 4K and now they've already got out 8K. And so who has to, all the manufacturers like your Sony's your Canon and all these and JVC have to go off and make cameras that can shoot 8K. Exactly. And then so that, that that's 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 our argument with um 8K with uh, and 4K. Then we have the oh yeah, but you know, Internet of Things and you know, connecting your house and your commercial. Oh yeah, well you know, if your internet is slow, like 5G is coming along, and um, we're not going to have 5G before like 2025. I don't believe. No, it's going to be very, and they're only piloting it here in Ireland at the moment. So that means I reckon it's another couple of years, and then phones. Then you have to upgrade your phone. To be a 5G compatible phone, and it's like it just like it's one of those things technology. And there's parts of Ireland that still don't even have broadband, yeah, 
They're still on dialect. Stations. A Garda yeah. being the, our police stations here for people that don't know what a Garda is. But our Garda stations ha have struggles with internet in their in their police stations. So you yeah, know. some of them lucky to, lucky to have a telephone to mind an in, an internet. So so we're still in the middle of not even having a country wide internet accessible network for everyone in the country. Yeah, uh, it's like it's fine. Five G rolled out in Dublin, but some places don't even have four G cellular. Yeah, yeah, like there, there, and there is a lot of places that you can go across Ireland that will have these these issues. So, but I think going back to the whole idea of like running out of space, needing routers in the house, far from speed and you know increasing technology that may not work in Ireland for the time being. Um, I think if looking outside of Ireland and globally, Google and Microsoft and Amazon, they need to be jumping on board all these other security companies, whether it be security companies for your, your doorbells and whatnot, and just saying, like, I know they have their doorbells for themselves, but for the other companies going, do you want to buy into our device, such as the Google Home? where you just need one device and you don't need additional hubs plugged into your router that's going to eat up space as well. And I know Google is small, like Google was all over CES with their Hey Google everywhere, um, talking about speakers, uh, about devices that all have the Google Assistant built in. And I think that's my old argument is like Google Home, building in all of these Google assistants. And I think maybe at the end of 2019 with all our podcasts, we might, the penny might flop with Google with regards to integrate G Suite with Google Home. Anyways, that's a that's another debate. I think that Google and Amazon really need to start building upon these other companies that are in, that are creating cameras and stuff for the homes, whether it be Whirlpool or whatever, and it means that you, if people won't, won't want a product, if it says you need to get another hub to plug into your router and to perform the following operations. Mm. That the device itself is what connects your internet, your internet and that's it, there's nothing else needed. You yeah, can figure it maybe with your mobile or something like that and yeah. that's about it. Or, or the other thing is they don't, I, I personally don't want a hundred different apps going, hold on, my doorbell rang, which app am I opening here on my phone? It should be all integration into one. And I think that's where the likes of Amazon, the likes of Microsoft, the likes of Google need to be going, hi guys, do you want to jump on board to our app? Because they're, they're the leaders of, of the market. However, like, mm. I've been really turned off at the moment in getting the ring doorbell. I, I, with security issues. And this goes back to I, do you know what? When, before you came online, Simon, I was going with all the Internet of Things devices. It it reminds you of like how scary some of the old films can be. Where you know, with I and then I started making a list of old films going back to 1998. I can't believe it was that old. 1998, Enemy of the State, Will Smith. Fantastic movie. Everything in Enemy of the State is real, as far as I'm concerned. We can be tracked and traced as much as we like. And yes. and, and now now like Amazon were claiming that it's not happening, but apparently the Amazon ring doorbells it's constantly being recorded. So like the information could be hacked. And people then know who's arriving at your doorbell, who's who's going to your house, how many times you're going into your house. That type of information is crazy that, that like people can know that because it's going up onto a cloud. Yeah, it's not encrypted and secure, and that and that seems to be the thing. It's like you have these amazing cloud services. You think the service would be really um, encrypted, protected, end user pr privacy would be highly important instead of just oh i'll just search and see who's called to the house today 
you know, and if I, if I'm ever going to buy myself a video doorbell, I think I just want to have a little one terabyte device in my house that go, okay, I can personally look back on the recording and see who was at my doorbell. Yes, it's going over the internet to tell you that Joe Bloggs has arrived on your doorbell and um, or a package has arrived for you. So it needs to be over the internet too. But it, I think it needs to have the highest encryption that no hacker can know that someone's arrived at my doorbell. And that's where like, I, I'm not comfortable with the cloud information on it. Because, because, because that's where there was the issue with, say, the baby cams as well and stuff like that. Because really, what, what's a baby cam? It's the same as a video doorbell, yeah. really, when you think about it. They're, they're, they're both just communication tools with a camera. So, and there was all those issues about people hacking into uh, video baby cameras and making noises and waking kids up and all that kind of stuff. So it's about protecting all of that. And um, or it's like the nanny cam, really, the teddy bear taking it and making it internet accessible. And yeah, I remember that we talked about that last year. Like the, one of the teddy bears that like it it wasn't secured. It was totally taken off the market. Mm. Um, but but like while while I had that website of like films that like feel real now, it's like nineteen ninety eight, Enemy of the State, twenty one years ago. I can't believe it's twenty one years ago since Will Smith um was in uh, Enemy of of the State. But brilliant film. I love that film. It, like I you know, I always think that you could update if you could get Will Smith back to do a new Enemy of the State, you could update that so much with technology. Minority report. Tom Cruise, you know, we have the the screens now that you can pull around the oblongs and um, the net. Uh, mm. And do you know what I only found out by doing this research? It was like, this page was brilliant. I'm going to put it up on the show notes of all films that include the Internet of Things and hacking. Uh, the net with Sandra Bullock, you know, and that, that was the old dial-up connections that was, used to be going on and a hacker with a little pie symbol. Sandra Bullock, yeah. Uh, I, in fact, I think my sisters thought I had a, a liking or a, a, a fa- I used to fancy Sandra Bullock. No, I just used to like the technology in, in, in films starring Sandra Bullock. Apparently, the net has a, the net version 2.0. They made a sequel at one stage to the net, which I have to actually find on online and have a watch of it in 2006. So I don't know how bad that, that film is. But the one, the one film that re- two films that really caught my attention as of recently with regards to, you know, how realistic it could be. The Circle, which is all about uh, social media. I don't know if you ever seen that film. Yeah, I've seen the trailer and I, I know what it's about. But it, yeah, it's basically a social media giant taking over a person's life and controlling it. And I think that yeah, I think that can easily be done in today's society. And I, I dot T, so I T, uh, 2016, so three years ago now, um, where an apprentice goes into a, a CEO's house, falls in love with his uh, daughter, uh, it all goes topsy turvy, and he has programmed um, the CEO's car and can also listen in to all the Internet of Things devices in the house. It can happen. Like you, you, you really do ask yourself, like, what type of security devices? If you're, if you're going into, um, the Internet of Things with your house, like Whirlpool came out at CES with a prototype where it's going to have an oven that you put a raw chicken into the oven. It's going to know by augmented reality that you have put a chicken in the oven. It's going to tell you how to cook that chicken and give you recipe ideas. And also connected to your Internet of Things, it, it can tell you, like, it's two hours left to cooking uh, your, your chicken. Um, so my thought, Simon, is like, well, well, you know, what's to say that someone couldn't hack your house, be listening into your house, turning on your oven, turning on your heating? What else? turning on your TV, turning off your TV, opening your front doors. It's, you know, 
What the fuck? Or ordering, ordering food for your fridge and you're getting deliveries three, four times a day of the same stuff. Because yeah. you think about people, the fridge can order the food for you. Amazon packages appearing out of nowhere. Like, yeah, it's just, it's become, it could be, your money could be gone in a few seconds. Yeah, and what, what, what type of hub or what type of device protects the whole lot? And I think if, if CES 2020 comes along, I think that you were talking about security across AV networks and IT networks. I think that's going to be a huge thing of like, well, hold on a minute, guys. Like Amazon's come out with a big boo-boo now with their ring doorbell that they'll have to mm-hmm. try and defend. How uh, how are they go- how are the companies going to defend saying like okay well our our device is going to be secure on your network and then is it going to yeah is it going to be that like you're going to have maybe every everyone's going to have to have a firewall in their house mm. but it has to be user orientated firewall not a commercial one where you know you're going to kill someone to try and program and. <laughs> And then VPNing from your mobile device every time you want to connect to your house. Because if you that's, everyone's using VPN now, VPN this, because of um, internet TV and stuff like that that people want to do on the sly. Or, oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, we won't admit to that. <laughs> mm. but, but even with voice controls, you know, and hey Google, hey Alexa, you know, or whatever, you know, you, you say to yourself, how much data is being kept online saying that Simon asked the Whirlpool cooker to turn on and cook his chicken. So the type of data that like the likes of the old Cambridge Analytica, you know, it, 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 mm. they're putting so much information online with Internet of Things devices saying that like, we know it's Simon Lang cooks at five o'clock in the evening. He's eating chicken. He's ordering stuff for his fridge. We are giving everything to the Internet of Things. And then they can give that information to say your subscription to Domino's just the four-star pizza and go, if he cooks dinner normally around half five, send a, send a promotional code to his to him at, at quarter to five so he might use us instead of cooking his own food and there you go advertisement people are not going to have a field day with all this i think we really started off 2019 with a very scary episode of all of all things techie haven't we sir you know let's go yeah, I, think, I think we're more concerned than than uh, than excited Let's go make tinfoil hats. I think I'm just going to go away and, and make a tinfoil hat now. It's get some 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 interesting, but we have to have the layer of security as well on it. Uh, Simon, great to talk to you as always. Um, I know Simon's going to be very busy in the next uh, couple of weeks. He has several projects to to close off on in the in the AV world. So uh, wish you luck on on closing them off if you can ever close them off. Yeah, I hope so. Anyway, move on to something new. Yeah. Um, but he will, if you do want to get in contact with All Things Techie and um, Simon, it's Simon Lang AV on, online on Twitter. And you, we can also uh, have any all our contact details on www.allthingstech.ie. All Things Techie Podcast, brought to you by two tech junkies, Justin Dawson and Simon Lang. For more, visit www.allthingstech.ie for all things techie. The All Things Techie Podcast is a product of the Extreme Media Network. For advertising and sponsorship opportunities, please visit www.extrememedia.ie. That's X-T-R-E-M-E, media.ie.